couple of years ago, after lockdown, I went to Angkor Wat. And for anyone who's spent their life in, in this area, it's extraordinary to see stories that originated in the vicinity of Jaipur and Delhi, uh, sculpted so very, very far away. You go down one corridor, there's Kurukshetra, just to the north of Delhi, all the stories that are happening there. Down another corridor, you see the tales of Krishna uh, and uh, all the stories that are taking place around Matra and so on. Um, the influence of India across much of Asia is there hiding in plain sight in the Buddhism of Korea and Japan, in the place names of Java and Cambodia, uh, in the sculpture, in the, re in the religious ceremonies that still carry on in Bali. And yet it's something which we failed to connect up. And the panel today, um, I am very, very proud to bring two uh, good friends uh, and two wonderful experts on this subject uh, to join the dots. Namana Huja, who is the great uh, hist historian of art in Delhi. We've sadly lost two of our greatest art historians and friends of the festival this year, both Kavita Singh, his colleague, earlier in the year, and BNG, BN Goswami, uh, more recently. So Naman is the last one standing. We need to look after you and uh, keep you swaddled in cotton wool, Naman. Look after your health, please. Um, and uh, he has spent uh, half a lifetime studying Gandhara, the influence of, uh, uh, of uh, 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 classical and other influences on, on that region. Uh, but he's also done a lot of work more recently on what's been going on in the South. Buddhism is often thought of as a North Indian phenomenon. And we forget that uh, when Xuanzang first came to, uh, the, the Chinese traveler monk came to India, while he certainly wanted to see Nalanda first, he also very much wanted to see Kanchipuram and the major Buddhist sites in South India. Uh, and that has been the focus, particularly the site of Phanagiri of some of Naman's new work. Suresh has done a spectacular book that I hope all of you have heard his, his uh, session on the tropical turn uh, and his session with Arti. Uh, and uh, he is a wonderful scholar of migration and the diffusion uh, of of both species and ideas. But today he's going to be speaking specifically on the whole issue of, of, of what is often called, in inverted commas, the Indianization uh, of Southeast Asia and how far this, we, this is a word that's, that's accurate and acceptable or how far it's actually misleading. So we're going to start off in India with Naman uh, and uh, I'm going to hand over to you. Both men are going to speak for about 20 minutes and then we'll join it all together and then throw it open to questions. Okay, um, sure. I've, for the past 15 odd years, been teaching courses on transculturalism and globalization in antiquity. And my specialization happens to be in the field of iconography. A lot of the books that I've contributed to or written have looked at the aesthetics that lie behind iconographic or visual communication. The migration of a visual culture from one part of a world to another is something that interests me and I try and share with my students in my classes. So let's look at the PowerPoint. And what might the forces of those migrations have been? Was it through traders, teachers, or travelers, as this session's called? Now, William raised something quite exciting. He said that wherever he went in mainland Southeast Asia, he found corridors named after the places in North India. Ayutthaya's and Kurukshetra's, and ought we not then to think of them much like we do the moving of Adelaide's and Perth's and New York's? Is this is William trying to make us see that before one anarchy, there was another William, that there was another colonialism fostered by India? Is I, that I've already raised on an earlier session <laughs> on the Cholas, where the possibility of the, uh, the Tamil merchant guilds being precursors of the East India Company in this room, and I have to say, it didn't go down well. <laughs> oh, right. Well, the, the question has to be raised. That's the point, that 
what happens when sacred geographies and place names are being copied and emulated? Is it a cultural transfer? Is it a knowledge transfer? Is it a use of the raw materials of that place which are being commandeered by South Asia for being sold and further traded? Or what was the definition of colonialism? Perhaps one needs to think about the use of one land for raw material and for market. Um, what was going on then in Southeast Asia? How do we think about these? traders? How do we think about these knowledge transfers? What were these teachers doing? Was this an acculturation of Southeast Asia, rendering them without their lingua francas and forever turning them into Sanskrit um, speakers and ennobled by Tamil or ennobled by Sanskrit or ennobled by whatever language they were now getting? Um, and was travel therefore merely a transculturalism that we look at innocently, or do we actually read a political and economic history into that transculturalism that took place in antiquity? Now, I don't think the two things are always the same. I think there is a difference between what happened in the early modern period and what happened in antiquity, and I think there is a, uh, but that's also because we don't have very rich resources, and my, um, my, my field is to be able to try and lend a little bit to these kinds of questions through the visual culture, which is the art history. Um, and in the end, I want to say that with all of this knowledge, what of all this migration and transculturalism in a world where we are becoming increasingly national chauvinistic, where chest thumping and national pride seem to be far more important rather than sharing across borders, where the anxiety of losing your culture is more of what use my, my classes in university for the past 20 years, when, frankly speaking, the national culture, not just in India, but everywhere, seems to be one of closing doors to the forces of globalization. So how can modern museums and exhibition making actually make a difference to all of this? So I think these are some of the questions which have guided our, our questioning and our writing. Now, what shall I point this toward? Can we get to the next, the first slide? It's not, oh, okay. So I specialize in what is called the post-Mauryan period, which is the period of the Satavahanas in South and Central India, and the Kushans in Northern India. And the Kushans are sort of active, uh, actively trading with a part of the world which is we loosely call the Roman world, but that's really a bit of a misnomer because the Roman world is a very spl much splendid uh, multicolored uh, empire uh, with many, many provinces, and they're not all, um, some of them are in contact with India, even if Rome is directly not in contact with India. There is a lot that is going on with the former, with the Hellenistic world, with Egypt, uh, and the connection with India. The Satvahana Empire is also connected with Egypt, but it's also connected with mainland Southeast Asia with island Southeast Asia. And um, so those are the two ends of the trade that I look at. Um, or perhaps can't look at. We have a new clicker. Uh, We've got a new clicker, but it doesn't seem to be. Or a battery into the clicker that's not working. Oh, could you put the next slide forward? Okay, so the book that I did on Panigiri, um, which Mark published a couple of years ago now, it looks at a remarkable stupa in Telangana about a two hour drive away from Hyderabad, which has been found covered with limestone sculptures of an exquisite quality and significance, which is, uh, which beggar belief, some of them. They come from what is in art historical parlance called the late Satvahana, early Ikshvaku style, which means that they belong to about the second to fourth centuries AD, the period that we call the Kushan period in Northern India. And this um, uh, lot of sculpture has some life-size um, sculptures which we hadn't seen ever before. Got a big Toran gateway like the one you have at Sanchi. You have beautiful statues of the Buddha. Next slide, please. 
Um, next slide, please. Okay, yeah, it's called Phanigiri because it's like the phana of a serpent. And the whole rock is S-shaped like a serpent, like a nag. And in the middle of the rock, you'll see a little square where rather like the money, which is the jewel which is kept in the serpent's hood, there is a, a little jewel of a monastery that lies inside the serpent. And... Um, that is the ancient monastery and stupa on top of Panigiri Hill. Um, now, amongst the sculptures that were found there, they're all, many of them were found smashed in pieces. But there are these Buddha statues, which will look a lot like the Buddha statues that we get in Anuradhapura, Amaravati, and all along the coast. So it means that Indian ideas were migrating from here and going down southward. We still don't see a flaming Ushnisha, um, the little flame on top that you start getting from about the third, fourth, fourth century. So it, this might be a little earlier. And it's a very good example to see how the Buddha statue actually moves to Anuradhapura at this time. Um, the most spectacu spectacular of the sculptures found at the site of Panigiri is one which used to be outside the monastery. And it shows the lesson of how not to hold on to power. Um, it's a story of Siddharth throwing away his inheritance and patrimony. He throws away his turban. And the turban goes flying up into the sky where it is received by celestials. Um, it's a rather remarkable sculpture and a very interesting choice of sculpture to position outside a monastery meaning this is the lesson that the young monks are being shown on their way, way in and out of the monastery. Their placement is quite interesting. Next slide, please. Yeah. Um, Panigiri has many other things which have deepened our understanding of what goes on in the culture of Andhra and how it moves towards Southeast Asia and moves to Sri Lanka in particular. So what were the kind of objects that moved from places like this to Southeast Asia at this time? And amongst them, some years ago, was this extraordinary discovery of a bronze ewer that turned up in the Mekong Delta, somewhere between Cambodia and Vietnam, that ended up now at the Ashmolean Museum in Oxford. And researching its composition and looking at it, its handle seems to be of a type that is made in Gandhara, the shape is of the type which is widely recorded in Amaravati. So it's a Kushan Satavahana design of a bronze vessel with the elephant spout and all, probably about the second century, but found again all the way far east in, in the Mekong. Okay, let's uh, try and move. Now, previously I'd done a lot of work in the region of Gandhara. And as my research deepened, I began to notice that there was inadequate attention being paid to the connections of the intermediaries, those who mediated the trade with South Asia, i.e. the Egyptians. People were always keen to talk about Gandhara as provincial Roman art or as Hellenistic, as a vestige of Hellenistic art. But they were always trying to connect it with what was going on with, in Greece at that time, rather than trying to connect it with what was going on in Egypt at that time. And I had to really think about why Egypt? What are the connections with Egypt? And I began to look at these Egyptian objects that had been found in Gandhara. Serapis, for instance, is a very distinctly Egyptian Roman god. Porphyry, we know, was only mined, a type of stone which was only found in northern Egypt. Um, the cameo of Heracles, found in Bannu, in the northwest frontier, is actually of a type which is quite Egyptian in the way that it has been sculpted. We found other Egyptian deities, like Hippocrates, the child of Isis, 
Now, little statuettes of Hippocrates have been found in Takshila, in Begram in Afghanistan, and in Mathura in northern India. So what were these little Egyptian statuettes doing traveling to India? What kind of people were bringing these Egyptian statuettes to India? So rather than looking at, all, uh, looking at it all as just Roman trade with India, one needed to prize open the nature of that Roman trade and look at its specific complexion as one that was coming from Egypt, from Egypt at that time. And this is borne out by the kind of textual sources on the Periplus of the Eritrean Sea and the kind of trade that was going on Berenike and hey presto, now we have a temple to Buddha, a, a shrine to Buddha and the Vrishnis that has been found in the courtyard of a temple to Isis in Berenike. Is it now thought to be a shrine or just a statue? I think it's a small shrine alongside the... the now, looking at this um, melange of ideas, I tried to summarize it all in a paper that I wrote called One Mother, Many Mother Tongues, looking at one statue where I found that rather remarkably that one statue seems to be surrounded by children of different iconographic systems of the ancient world. Something Zoroastrian, something Phoenician or Lebanese, or Cypriot, whatever you want to call it, but of the Roman period. The Dioscuri, who are Hellenistic, Hippocrates, who is Egyptian, Kartikeya, who is the son of Shiva, all surrounding one figure, who sits rather like a Madonna and child, prior to which one might have called her Demeter, prior to which, or alongside, one might have called her Isis, or in Sanskrit sources, one would call her Amatrika, and Buddhist sources, you would call her Ahariti. So what is the effect of all of this transculturalism? Are we losing cultural specificity? This kind of a sculpture was put on the outside wall of a monastery in Peshawar area in about 200 AD. What does that tell us about the kind of population that was living in the Peshawar area in 200 AD, that all of the people who came from Lebanon and Egypt and Greece and Iran and India could identify the little children around the mother goddess and all know that they belong to the cult of the mother goddess and the monks in the monastery were going to be able to look after them. Now, visual statu statues like this are performing a certain public function. We have to think about the public placement of these things. And I think these kinds of images tell us a lot about what's going on in the, in the public environment at that time. Now, moving to what I've been more interested in recently has been things in South India. And in Maharashtra, there were these discoveries of some late Hellenistic, early Roman objects, Perseus and Andromeda, or uh, a statuette of Poseidon that came up in a place called Brahmagiri, which is not too far from Kolhapur. These are things that are lying in the Kolhapur Museum. And they'd all been kept together in one hoard. Somebody had protected it and kept it all together. Now, it's not just that these things are coming to India, but Indian things are going to the rest of the world. And in Hoxney in England, you have this wonderful pepper mill, which clearly, which was found with pepper in it. And the pepper we know went from India, from Kerala or somewhere to, to uh, the British Isles. And it's at the same time when this extraordinary ivory statuette was found in the debris from the same, about the same period or maybe a little early, earlier, definitely before 79 AD when Mount Vesuvius erupted because that ivory statuette was found in Pompeii. And I've been sort of reopening the conversation around that figure that was found in Pompeii. It's clearly probably made in central India or Maharashtra, but excavated all the way out in in Italy. And that does make us think about what did the Italians imagine this was? Why were they importing it? Was she just a curious bit of exotica? Or did they realize that this was a yakshi, a nature spirit? Did it have meaning for the Italian who wanted to bring in interesting figures into his garden, which were connected with the worship of nature and the pantheon that was connected with plants. 
it seems that he was somebody who might have wanted these kinds of iconographic elements. And so the Italian importer is not somebody who's doing this mindlessly, perhaps, merely because he's looking for exotica, but perhaps because he's a little bit more informed. And that makes it all the more interesting for us because it means that ideas are migrating between people with a certain kind of awareness. Um, I'm gonna end with this slide because this was the last big project that I was involved with as a co-curator of an exhibition called India in the World in which the British Museum lent 100, and, 100 sculptures which we paired in conversation with about 100 odd sculptures from Indian collections. So rather than seeing the history of the world in 100 objects through the lens of the British Museum, we tried to take those 100 objects from the lens of the British Museum and pose questions to them through the lens of another 100 objects chosen from an Indian perspective. And we put them in conversation and in dialogue with each other in order to be able to see what happens to world history if we look at transculturalism from an Indian perspective. Can there be an Indian way of thinking about world history rather than looking at our colonizers' way of thinking about world history? And let's actually try and address this question straight. And let's see how does it make a difference? What are the practical differences that we have to make in the way we communicate these kinds of histories of transculturalism to the public? Or do we just want to create a little bit of propaganda which seems to be failing about some kind of bonhomie that existed in the world? Oh, look. We were all connected and we've all come from one place and we're all migrants. Well, nobody really in the political classes seems to care. And so we've got to be able to do something to be able to take those anxieties or those put downs and those problems front and center and let's try and talk about them at the museum because I think the museum and educational institutions do still have a role to play. And I don't think we are completely irrelevant. Okay. Are the slides working? Uh, could we go into the I... second PowerPoint? Yeah. Great, thanks. So uh, I want to get us started with where William brought us right at the beginning at Angkor Wat. Uh, if you go to Angkor, in the first gallery of the temple, you would observe a colossal eight-armed Ashtabuja image of Vishnu, uh, which is believed to have been the central image of the temple, but it's no longer in the Garbhagriha, which, is now, which now houses four Buddha images. Now, this image of Ashtabuja Vishnu is not treated as Vishnu, even though Cambodians are aware of Vishnu as a sort of subsidiary deity uh, who has been appropriated in a Buddhist context. But rather, the statue is venerated as an ancestor spirit. So if you go to Angkor Wat on festive occasions, uh, locals will sort of bring offerings, including non-vegetarian offerings, uh, to this image of Vishnu. So on one particular day that I was at Angkor Wat, I, there was a huge uh, roasted pork that was offered to Vishnu. Now, that's unthinkable, of course, in an Indian context. But for many Cambodians, uh, these statues are not seen as Hindu statues, but rather ancestor spirits. Now, this notion may be a very old one. Uh, a lot of the earliest Hindu temples in Cambodia, those that dated the, between the 6th and 8th centuries, were built on top of proto-historic cemeteries. Now, this is not unlike the Buddhist stupas that we see in South India, which very often occupied megalithic sites. They're grafting themselves onto something that is already existing. Now, this point is very important. Uh, India and Southeast Asia share a common cultural and environmental substratum. There is already a lot in common before this conversation, before this exchange or cultural diffusion takes place. I mean, think about uh, things like tree spirits. Uh, the belief in tree spirits is pervasive in Thailand. Uh, and we know this is ancient because they are venerating trees that are native to Southeast Asia, trees that are not venerated in India or found in India. The Hopea odorata tree, for example, which is locally called Nang Takian in Thailand. And uh, very often locals would bring offerings of beautiful dresses which they would hang on the trees 
as sort of an offering to this tree spirit. It, it's kind of a yakshi cult, but the, there are also features that you would only find uh, in Thailand. And, and, and there are multiple examples of this all across Southeast Asia. Also the veneration of uh, the sacred landscape of rocks. Uh, some of the earliest Shaivite temples in Cambodia, for example, we don't find a Shivalinga, but a natural rock formation that is being worshipped as a Swayambulinga. And possibly, just like the cemetery sites, these uh, rock sites might have already been sacred to the populations. So Hinduism and Buddhism uh, you know, sort of grafting themselves onto pre-existing cultural practices. And they're also appropriating them. Right? Uh, that might explain the ease of, of, uh, of the Indianization, as it were, of Southeast Asia. Now, for better or worse, this term has gained currency and has come to stay. But it is a problematic term. It has been rejected altogether in some circles. It is true that the meta language, the framework of classical Southeast Asia is very Indian, but the undercurrents, the way in which this is interpreted is very Southeast Asian. I mean, this would be clear to anyone from India visiting Southeast Asia. There's something familiar about the culture, but it's also radically different in the way it's interpreted and the way it plays out what, in public What was the life. famous Tagore quote? It, I, Tagore, when he visited Angkor Wat, said I felt that I'd seen something very familiar, oh, yes, which was yes, also very right. strange. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. Uh, that's the same with Bali, right? It's a Hindu island, but you know the version of Hinduism that's practiced there is radically different from what we might be familiar with in India. Now, the agents of cultural diffusion are really uh, sort of multifarious characters. We have, you know, the title alluded to teachers, travelers, traders, and so on. Um, in the earliest periods, it's quite clear that we have lots of uh, mercantile families who are responsible for the diffusion of cultural features. And uh, for a long time, this used to be sort of inferred from legends uh, or, or documentary sources like inscriptions. But now we have firm ancient DNA evidence from the Wat Kom No Cemetery in Cambodia. Uh, where this ancient individual shows about 40 to 50 percent of his genome deriving from uh, South India. And, and in places like Sumatra and Cambodia, of course, you have this long-standing local stories about an Indian male ancestor marrying a you know, local princess or a Naga princess in many cases. Uh, a lot of those tend to be recycled uh, across time and space. Um, but the bigger point I really want to drive in here is that uh, Southeast Asians had a lot of agency in the way they interpreted Indic models of polity and religion and so on. Uh, there are features in Southeast Asian Hinduism and Buddhism that are quite exclusive to Southeast Asia, whether it's the kind of mudras that the Buddha is displaying, right? He's often seen in double abhaya mudra or double vitarka mudra, which you don't really see in India, or the octagonal temples of Sambor Prakuk, which is a city that William and I have both visited, amazing cities, but filled with 7th and 8th century temples. And most of these temples are octagonal, ashtasra temples, but you don't really find a lot of octagonal temples in early India. They are there in the architectural treatises. The Matsya Purana, for example, refers to these octagonal temples, but you don't really find them on the ground. Uh, but the Cambodians you know, latch into this idea and they decide, you know, let's build you know, most of our temples as octagonal structures, at least in Sambur Prai Kuk. So there have been lots of different models that scholars have evolved to talk about these processes. They see it as localization, cosmopolitanism. Uh, I, I tend to favor the convergence model uh, because of the fact that you know, Southeast Asia and South Asia share a lot of things in common to begin with. Okay, let's just have a look at some of the textual and archeological sources for this interaction. Uh, one of the earliest references, this is definitely interpolated, it's from the Sundara Kandam, uh, but it has a lovely reference to Java, which you can reach by ship, right? Uh, it's described as Yabadvipa, rich in jewels, splendid with its seven kingdoms, and to Swarna Rupyaka, ornamented with gold mines. Uh, and of course, this label of, of Southeast Asia as the land of gold has kind of stuck on. If you go to Bangkok, you're going to land at Swarnabhumi Airport. Uh, but it, it might be more connected with the idea of you know, gaining fortunes from trading in the region rather than actually uh, sort of engaging with gold mines, which are actually few and far between in Southeast Asia. Uh, as I said, we have lots of archaeological evidence for Indian activity in uh, Southeast Asia, uh, lots of pottery, lots of uh, semi-precious stones, uh, and of course these uh, Marian ring stones are interesting because they were found in Thailand in conjunction with gold foils which bore the same designs, so it gave us a sense that they were using these, at least in Thailand, as jewelry molds. And, uh, 
even the kinds of semi-precious uh, objects that we find, they are being fashioned into uh, shapes and motifs very peculiar to Southeast Asia, like the uh, carnelian tigers, for example. Uh, those are really popular in Southeast Asia. And even though the carnelian might be coming from India, and they may have been worked by Indian uh, smiths in Southeast Asia, uh, the shape is something that we only find in Southeast Asia, and to some extent in Southern China as well. Uh, early pottery is found as far afield as uh, Bali in the east. And, and what were the Indians coming to Southeast Asia for? What, what, what were they interested in trading? Now, there's a whole bunch of forest products, camphor, benzoin, stick-like, civet musk, rattan, uh, gold, of course, you know, that's something that's referred to in textual sources, cloves and nutmeg. Uh, there's actually an early find of uh, a nutmeg from Sangul in, from the Kushana period site. Uh, okay, just a few glimpses of the early epigraphic and sculptural record. Uh, don't have a lot of time for this, so I'm going to zoom through it quite quickly. quickly. So the earliest inscriptions that we have uh, in an in Indic script and an in Indic language are interestingly from Borneo, right? You wouldn't expect it. You, you'd think, you know, it'd be somewhere on the coast of like Myanmar or Malaya, but uh, these fourth or fifth century inscriptions are found in uh, Kutai, which is of course now famous because it's going to be the new capital of Indonesia. And I think, you know, that was quite deliberate, right? Going back to the origins as it were of Indonesian history. Uh, and these inscriptions tell us about uh, the King Mulavarman's performance of uh, very lavish Vedic sacrifices, including one called Bahu Suvarnaka, you know, literally, you know, meaning lots, lots of gold. Uh, and, and scholars have been divided as to how to interpret them. I mean, there are records of, you know, gifts of hundreds of cows to Brahmins, but it doesn't seem to tally with the kind of environment that we have in Borneo. Remember, it's heavily forested. It's not a good place for, you know, uh, breeding lots of cows. Um, so is a lot of this just, you know, exaggeration? Um, quite possibly, I mean, you see poetic exaggeration of this sort in, in uh, Sanskrit inscriptions in South Asia as well. But, um, you know, the, the broader point is that they were very consciously adopting these Indic modes of kingship. And, and that comes through, uh, you know, really quite well in Purnavarman's inscription from West Java, uh, dating to almost around the same period. And in one of these inscriptions, he compares his feet to those of Vishnu, Vishnu Riva Patadvayam. And in an another inscription, he does the same to his elephant, where he compares it, its footprints uh, to those of Airavata, right, Indra's elephants. And moving on to uh, slightly later periods, 7th, 8th century inscriptions get even more interesting. Uh, there's one from central Vietnam, which talks about uh, Temple to Valmiki, right? So they're very conscious in, in these uh, 7th, 8th century inscriptions to, uh, of, of the Sanskrit epic tradition. Uh, there's a, another one from the 6th century in northern Cambodia that talks about a grant for the recitation of the Ramayana in a temple context, and also the Purana and the Mahabharata, which are referred to in the same inscription. Uh, but it's not just Sanskrit, right? This story can only be told uh, with the inclusion of other Indic languages in the Mon-speaking areas of Myanmar and Thailand. A Pali is a very important epigraphic language, and we also have Tamil, right? Tamils still remain the most significant demographic group in Southeast Asia, concentrated today mostly in Myanmar, Malaysia, Singapore, and Sumatra. Uh, but the Tamil footprint has been around in Southeast Asia for almost 2,000 years. The earliest inscriptions going back to the second and third century uh, the, the, the most interesting one on the screen is that belonging to a goldsmith, right? The inscription literally reads, Perum Patan Kal, the stone of the great goldsmith. And we, uh, we know that there have uh, lots of documentary sources that have been lost to us because Chinese records do make mention of them. Uh, the, the Sui Shu, the history of the Sui dynasty, for example, talks about a Chinese general plundering the capital of Champa, that's in central Vietnam, and carrying away 1,350 volumes of Buddhist scripture in the local language. Uh, but a lot of this is lost to us because people in Southeast Asia, like in many parts of India, were writing on palm leaves. And when you stop copying text on palm leaves, you know, they cease to exist. And we know that they're writing on palm leaves because we've got imitations of these leaves that were buried, for example, in, in stupas, uh, as you see on the screen of this fourth or fifth century uh, golden manuscript that imitates the shape of the palm leaves. Uh, just turning briefly to iconography, I mean, uh, Obviously, again, the inspiration is Indian. They're drawing from Gupta or Andran models, uh, in, 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 and you see variations, right? There, there's a strong 
pick and choose kind of thing going on. You see Vishnu's with the conch on the hip style, but you also see Vishnu's holding this globular object, which you find in some uh, Gupta period Vishnu's as well. And the Buddhists, of course, you know, uh, were very active in Southeast Asia as well, and they were quite conscious of their Hindu competitors. There's this lovely uh, relief from Tampra Potisat in central Thailand. It's a cave site that shows the Buddha being venerated by uh, Vishnu and Shiva. Now, in Indian context, Vishnu and Shiva are mostly the absent reference. You find Brahma and Indra uh, worshiping the Buddha, but, but here, you know, it, it's uh, Vishnu and Shiva who are venerating the Buddha. And the Gupta models of the Buddha, you know, they, they continue to be quite pervasive in, in Southeast Asian sculpture long after the Gupta fashion sort of falls, uh, you know, out of fashion in India. So these are 8th century images from uh, the middle Mekong Valley in Laos and, and southern Cambodia, uh, but long after the uh, Gupta style, you know, ceased to be current in India itself. Okay, just finally, uh, turning to a case of localization, how the texts are being reinterpreted for in, in local context. I'd like to start at the Javanese Ramayana. It's the earliest Southeast Asian Ramayana that we have, dates to the ninth century. Um, and interestingly, it's not you know, inspired directly from the Valmiki Ramayana, but the Bhattikavya or Bhattis Ravanavada. So they were really up to date with you know, more recent versions of the Ramayana as well. And it's almost contemporary with the Ramayanic reliefs that we find on the Prambanan Temple in central Java. Now, uh, in, if you read the Javanese Ramayana, you would think that you know, uh, the action is taking place on the island of Java and not in northern India. The landscape is entirely localized. You have uh, the mountain Menakagiri, for example, calling out to Hanuman, uh, telling him, you know, you can take shelter, uh, take rest on me. I will treat you to rose apple and durian, mango, mangosteen, kachapi, lime, limus, kapundung, langsep, and sweet duhet, and a variety of Southeast Asian fruits. Again, same thing with the seascapes. They are populated by fish that a Southeast Asian audience would have been familiar with. So these are the uh, famous uh, Shaivite temples in, in Prambanan, central Java. They have the finest series of Ramayanic uh, reliefs anywhere in the world, really, in my opinion. And finally, um, let me turn briefly to the Ramayana in Myanmar. Now, uh, unlike Java, we don't have a old Ramayana that survives in Myanmar. There are textual references to uh, the Ramayanic story in earlier Mon, Pew, and Burmese sources. But the Ramayanas that are popular in Myanmar today mostly date to the late 18th century, especially the Yama Piazza Toji by Nam Yonataka Kokang. Um, and I'm just going to read a short passage from this to end it off to give you a sense of how the Ramayana has been localized in Myanmar. So this, the context of this is Sita's second fire ordeal when she comes back from the forest. This is after she has Lava and Kusha and she's asked to go through another fire ordeal. So the people of Ayodhya are curious about Thida, that's how the Burmese called Sita's fire ordeal. They have never seen one before and they will go to see it when she returns. Women folk, however, show special interest in the ordeal and many of them discuss it. One group, though, the consorts of Rama's three brothers expresses discontent. Urmila is the first to express her opinion. After such a long-term banishment that Sita suffered when she was away from her home, Rama is being unfair. She takes off her earplug and throws it away as a sign of discontent. Hemila, another discontented person, says, after Sita proved her innocence with a fire ordeal, she was banished to a distant forest. She suffered a long time in the forest, and now she is requested to undergo another fire ordeal. It is unfair that she has such bad luck. We are unhappy to live in such an unfair world. Now, the, uh, you know, true to form, the, the women of this Burmese Ramayana are feisty, as you would expect of the Burmese woman. And it's also being used as a vehicle for you know, transmitting uh, contemporary discontent with the status of women in 18th century Myanmar. Thank you. Brilliant. Well, two spectacular presentations, incredibly wide-ranging, incredibly fascinating, and, 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 and based on such depth of, of knowledge and research. Both of you, amazing. Um, just a couple of questions before I throw it open to the audience. Naman, first of all, what happened to Southern Buddhism? Uh, it's, I mean, it, it's much more invisible than, than Northern Buddhism. You can go around the North, you can still see the great stupas at Sarnat, Sanchi, uh, there are a lot of Buddhist stuff lying around. Why, when you go to Kachipuram, is that nothing visible? 
of of the Buddhist world that once existed? There are statues in the Chennai Museum that were found in the Kanchipuram area. There are still statues lying forgotten under wayside shrines um, in the Kanchipuram area of Buddha. Um, they're not, the temples seem to have fallen out of use uh, at some point. And the questions that need to be asked are, what made those temples fall out of use? Was it a conscious effort to make them fall out of use? Or did public opinion change? What led to a shift in public patronage in Tamil Nadu? Uh, what were the forces that we know aided that shift in public patronage? Um, so I think uh, these are tough questions um, to ask. I mean, they're not quite tough questions to ask, but I think they're tough questions to answer definitively. Um, because there are statues that are lying around. Now, one port remained, Nagapattinam. And indeed, from in the Chola period, Nagapattinam continued to make sculpture and trade with Sri Lanka, Jaffna, and further you down. You can see very nice Nagapatnam statues of all places in the Chandigarh Museum. There's some nice little uh, bronzes there. There's yes. also currently in the uh, National Museum of Art, the uh, Modern Art in Jaipur House. Yeah, it's in the Roots well, that, and Roots that's exhibition. closed yeah. uh, a few days ago. Yeah, but spectacular. Those are from the Chennai Museum. So yes, there were um, shrines, Buddhist shrines, which fell out of use in southern India. Andhra, Tel Telangana, Karnataka, Kerala and Tamil Nadu had a number of Buddhist shrines that did fall out of use. And one has to ask how those sculptures and those shrines were commandeered, how they were, their materials were reused and turned into Brahmanical shrines. When did that happen? Um, where also, can a, we a find- A related question. How much of that whole Buddhist world in South India iconographically and otherwise migrates into the Hindu temples. Is there much influence or is yes, there a I break? Yes, I think there is. I think we need to not look at the cast of the main characters and iconography. There's no point, but it's, it's important to look at the rest of the repertory, <laughs> if you get my metaphor. I mean, it's the supporting cast. Uh, the main characters, whether it's a Vishnu or a Shiv or a Buddha, they change. But it's the Ganas the Vidyadharas, the Gandharvas, the Kinnars, the, those characters that you see around them, that's where you see the, the paraphernalia that accompanies the main deity remains much the same linguistic visual lexicon that seems to carry on. And there we find very interesting continuities, especially from the Satvana Ikshvaku into the Chalukya material. Um, so if you study Badami and look at all these little marginal figures in Badami and you try and compare them with the earlier lot of figures of the Ikshvakus in Nagarjuna Konda, or when you look at it with Satvahana sites at Amaravati, there you will certainly see a lot of correspondences and continuities. Suresh, looking to Southeast Asia, an earlier generation of Indian historians, the nationalist generation of the 1940s and 50s, were very keen on this idea of Hindu colonies that you had. Uh, uh, the, the, it was a sort of, um, you know, the, the Raj, but of a Pallava variety uh, or a Chola variety taking over chunks of Southeast Asia. Now, obviously, uh, people go for more cultural transfusion or diffusion. Uh, and, and as the title of this uh, lecture um, said, traders, teachers moving around and, and, and your chaps leaving their DNA uh, in, in, the, in the soil, but is there any, other than the Chola attack on, in 1025, which has that one big inscription in the Tanjore temple, what's the evidence for political or military action by India in Southeast Asia? To be honest, there isn't much evidence uh, to suggest that there, were, there was any kind of political imperialist enterprise. Even the success of the Chora campaign has been doubted. 
Uh, it's not quite clear whether there was any political control exercised after Rajendra's invasion. What of would Shibuja. you think? We've had Anirud Kanaseti here two days ago say, very much casting doubt on it. Where do you stand on that debate? Well, from, from an archaeological perspective, there certainly is a proliferation of Chora style temples and granite images uh, in a Chora idiom in Southeast Asia, coming from sites in southern Thailand and Sumatra, which is precisely the same port where the same port sites are where Tamil traders have been visiting for centuries. Uh, so I think there might have been some sort of, you know, uh, quasi political presence in, in those port cities, particularly in the Straits of Malacca. Uh, because the, the, That's quite a big deal. Yeah. Controlling the Straits of Malacca gives you access to China. Mm. And so if you yeah. do have actual political control of the Straits, that implies genuine Indian sea power yeah. in Southeast Asia. And, and one can make that inference on the basis of the 12th and 13th century uh, Hindu Chora style temples that we find in Qianzhou in southern China. Right? That, that might have been the end game for some of the Tamil traders involved in this region. So going back earlier, there's also a 7th century inscription in uh, southern Thailand at a site called Takwapa, where the Tamil traders who set up this temple to Vishnu, the image still survives. It's very much in the Pallava idiom. And they named the temple's tank after the ruling Pallava king, Nandivarman III. Right? It's a bit like you know naming sites in North America after like Elizabeth or Charles II and so on. Or James, so, so the, Duke the, of York. It, it, it's really not paying any kind of lip service to local authorities uh, when you name a structure uh, after the king who lives you know far away. So you're kind of claiming some kind of political space, uh, even though and, and there've also been uh, Pallava royal seals that have turned up in Thailand and, and Sumatra as well. So. It's possible that there might have been a political representative, but by and large, I would say the presence is more mercantile than political. Like. To both of you, just a final question before we open up. The idea that's sometimes floated, first, I think, by Dennis Hudson uh, and more, recent, more recently in the Ocean of Chern uh, by Sajiv Sanyal, that Pallava kings came back from Southeast Asia and ruled in Kachipuram. Do either of you buy that story? I mean, that's really made on the basis of this one inscription that we find in the Vaikuntha Permal Temple in Kanchipuram. And even then, like the, the word that he uses is Gaganam, right? A deep abyss. That's what he says he crosses. So it's not even clear if it's supposed to be an ocean or some other kind of, you know, topographical structure. Yeah, it, it, so it's, I, I, it's a distant. I, I would say a lot of speculation is involved there. But, but the Pallava and Kamir families do share some legends in common, in particular the one that I alluded to earlier about you know marrying this Naga princess and tracing descent from them. So, but but those are literary motifs that are recycled throughout India and Southeast Asia. Thanks. Yes, I mean I think that's exactly the point where I can lift off. I can't really comment on the nature of the sources of the seventh to tenth century period Sanskrit and Tamil that is being used in South India at that time. I don't specialize in that, but one does need to ask the larger historical question about what are the nature, what's the nature of the intentions behind the nomenclature and the kind of cultural references that they are making at this time and what does that signify, who is being placated or what does that kind of imperial authority mean to people in Southeast Asia. Um, one needs to ask whether to what extent does propaganda help in the maintenance of a balance of trade? Um, why do Southeast Asian merchants and governors and kings need to maintain a certain balance of trade in favor of India rather than a balance of trade or be autonomous in that trade or trade with China? What are the forces that lead them to favor India as their trading partner? And I think let's ask those tough questions because I'm, I think the answers will come out to be quite interesting, that there is a profitable and beneficial trading arrangement in all likelihood. Otherwise, uh, the local population and governors would have sought to trade with somebody else. We're out of time, but I'm still going to defy Paul uh, and uh, ask uh, for one, one question from the audience. First, their hand up, this gentleman here. So, uh, as these uh, slides were, uh, presentations were very insightful, so I'm curious to know the research methodology which you adopted while making these because the, all the bits of these historical documentation are scattered all over the South Asian region. So, it's good if uh, the people who are interesting, interested to do further studies or researches about it, if you can show some light towards the research methodology of yours. 
your research methodology, meaning how did we find these sculptures and how did I find all this material or what how is my you, way of studying this material? So how you put all these uh, scattered pieces uh, into an insightful presentation like this? <laughs> that's, that's the geniuses these men are. <laughs> I don't know what to say. Yeah. I mean, we read different kinds of histories and different kinds of sources. You pull out, you, you are tasked with that. You work in a museum basement for many years and you have to think creatively about what each little object and terracotta shard in that museum means. And you have to try and use all the possible resources available to you to read the histories of that time to be able to fit it into some kind of a narrative to imagine how it could have been used and there has to be a very plausible set of uh, reasons as to why. So, for instance, when I did more scientific and rigorous and more sedate scholarly work, when I was given the opportunity and time to do that, uh, one could sit down and actually do that kind of research per object. I highly recommend both these gentlemen's books. Naman's incredible Gandharan volume of Marg uh, is, is widely available. Uh, Suresh's Tropical Turn is one of my books of the year from last year. Uh, absolutely fantastic. I think Tropical Turn is on sale now. It's sold out. You've missed it, I'm afraid, but it is and, available and on so Amazon and, and in all good bookshops. <laughs> uh, and um, I'll be producing a book on this subject next September called The Golden Road. Um, so you can go through all my footnotes minutely. <laughs> oh, then the